All right. So, Minister Echoes, whenever you are ready, it is all you. Do you see us on Facebook? Um, let me let him, let me see. Hold a second. Okay, yes, you can see it. Okay, all right. So whenever you're ready, it is all you. Uh, I say good morning to everybody. Good morning. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just thank you, Father, for waking us up this morning, allowing us to see another day, Lord. Father God, we just ask you, Father, for your mercy and your grace, Father God, that you will present this lesson, Father God, that you will fill us each with the Holy Spirit, so we may receive your word and hear your word, Father God, so we will understand your word, Father God. Lord, we need you in a strong way, Father God. And Lord, we just present this day to you, Lord, in each and every person, Father God. And we just ask you, Lord, that we just be bold witness for you to proclaim your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, and welcome to the Kingdom Praise and Fellowship Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson. Today is May 21st, 2023, and our lesson's entitled, An Ethiopian is Baptized. We're still in the spring theme of Jesus Calls Us, and we are in Unit 3, the birth of the, of the church. Our devotional reading comes from Isaiah chapter 16, verses 9 through 14. The background scriptures and the lesson for today comes from Acts chapter 8. Verses 26 to 40. The time to, um, uh, that this takes place is AD 36. And the place is on the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. Our golden text for today is, and he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized them. And that's from Acts chapter 8, verses 38. Now, today's lesson um, concerns a religious pilgrimage um, who journeyed to Jerusalem to visit the temple over 2,000 years ago. And this pilgrimage was by the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. He traveled to Jerusalem on his lifetime journey, which probably took him several weeks. But this journey left a great impression on him, and it changed his life forever. This lesson also introduces to us Philip, one of the first deacons who moved from serving the widows and feeding the widows to preaching the gospel. Now, this Philip is not the same Philip as the Apostle Philip. This Philip, again, was one of the deacons. Now, Philip, like Stephen, who was also one of the deacons, was full of faith of the Holy Spirit, and he did great wonders and miraculous signs by the Holy Spirit. These men proclaimed the word of God throughout Samaritan and the surrounding areas. One of the things that Philip did was he was one of the first people to take the gospel to the Samaritans in fulfillment of Jesus' directive in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This happened as a result of persecution in Jerusalem during the highly productive ministry in Samaritan. An angel of the Lord directed Philip to go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Again, that's in Acts chapter 26. And that's where our lesson takes place today. These men who we would call evangelists were called, as we are all called to be. And I know as our story deal with a lot of baptism, but before a person can be baptized, they have to receive the word of God. So I'm leaning towards more on the evangelistic area of it. So what does evangelism mean? It's simply sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that the Lord died, was buried, rose from the dead, and is coming back for us. Without, without evangelism, Souls will be lost and the church will wither and die. 
in this lesson, Philip was called by angel from his very public ministry because remember, he was a Samaritan at this time, speaking to large crowds of people. And he was called from speaking to a multitude of people to speaking the gospel to one person, that one person who wanted to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when you really have a desire to learn something, God is going to make a way for you to get the information that you need. So instead of, instead of starting from verse 29 of the scripture, I'm actually going to start from verse 26. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candon, Candrate, which means queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home, was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip to go to that chariot and stay near it. Now, just going back, the angel of the Lord who gave Philip the divine appointment to go down to, the, to um, Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Gaza, if you recall, whenever we saw the word the angel of the Lord is normally mentioning Jesus Christ himself. So he gave him this directive himself. And the angel of the Lord, just in case you want to go back and check it out, is mentioned both in the Old and New Testaments. In the Old Testament, this angel is equated, as I mentioned to you before, as God himself. And you can see that in Genesis chapter 22, verses 11, and Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now, we also see it um, in Matthew, in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. When the angel of the Lord spoke, it was thus the Lord speaking. Matthew tells us that as well. And as I mentioned to you before, Philip left a fruitful ministry to go to the desert to see the Ethiopian. And although it may seem foolish to man to leave a multitude to go speak to one person, you know, it may seem foolish to us, but this is God's divine anointing. This is something, a message that he wanted the Ethiopian to get. Um, again, God hears our, our prayers. Now, what do we know about this Ethiopian man? Well, it said, the scripture says that he was an Ethiopian and that he was a eunuch, which technically means that he had been emasculated or castrated. And... Also during this time period, um, during the first century, it was also a term used for government officials because it showed that they, excuse me, they had an important military role or political role. Most of your units really worked in the king's palace um, overseeing the women. And some of the kings felt more comfortable with a unit there because they had no desire to be with a woman and they couldn't be with a woman. So who's best to leave your, your women, your concubines and your wives with them? But in this particular case, this man, the scriptures show that this man had great authority because he served as the minister of finance under the queen, who was the mother of Candace of Ethiopia. And it, most of the queens were called that Candace of Ethiopia. The union also had come to Jerusalem. Now, how he heard about Jesus Christ, we really don't know. It could have been from when Sheba went to visit Solomon. She may have brought back some words about how Solomon's God, where the people were able to follow. But nevertheless, whatever God they serve over Ethiopian, he wasn't interested in. He was interested in seeking the truth. He was, he was looking for Jesus Christ. Now, we're not told whether this was a whether this Ethiopian was a proselyte who was converted under Judaism, undergoing circumcision and the baptism. And I'm gonna say no because. Later, we find out that he's baptized. He gets baptized. But he was probably a god fearing man. He simply probably visited the Jewish synagogues. He came up there to worship with them. He was reading and learning about their scriptures. But nevertheless, he was hungry for the word of God. Verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. Philip went immediately to the chariot. So God gave him a command to do something, and he went immediately to do what God told him to do. 
He didn't second guess what God told him to do. He did it. Now, I would love to say I was that obedient. But sometimes, you know, you get the impression that God wants you to do some things. But instead of seeking and doing what God wants you to do, you kind of ration it out. We got to be more obedient to doing what God calls us to do when he calls us to do it. Upon reaching the chariot, he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Let us know another couple of things. One, that this man was educated because he could read. And then he was also reading out loud. And a lot of times when you read out loud to something, you're trying to concentrate so you can understand what's being read and so you can focus on it. And he was trying to really seek what God was saying from this passage. And then we also learned that this man was rich because the average person couldn't afford a copy of Isaiah. It was a very expensive book, which indicated that he had some kind of wealth. Then Paul asked him if he understood what he was reading. And that's important because, you know, I don't know about you, but I can read something all day long, but unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to me, it's just words. So not only was he reading it, but did he comprehend what he was reading? which is important. The unit asked him, how can I? Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And just think about that. This is a perfect stranger who's walking beside your carriage. You don't know who he is, but because you compel, and I believe that God actually um, prepared his heart to receive with Philip as a witness, he allowed Philip to come up to talk to him about the word. It also shows the hunger and the thirst that he had for God's word. Verse 32, this is a passage of scripture which the unit was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before a shearer is silent, so was he, so did he not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of this distance who can speak of his descendants, for well, his life was taken from the earth. The unit asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Now it's important that he understands exactly who Isaiah is referring to, because if you don't know who he's referring to, you can miss the entire picture. Um, the passage of scripture, this passage of scripture is one of the clearest prophecies concerning the death of Christ in the same in the Old Testament. Isaiah 35, me, Isaiah 53 describes our Lord Jesus Christ in his birth, and we can see that in verse one and two, the life of ministry, verses three, the substitutional death, which is in verses four and nine, and his victorious resurrection, resurrection, which is in verses 10 through 12. The idea of substitutional sacrifice is one that is found from the beginning of the Bible to the end. God killed animals so that he might clothe Adam and Eve. And we see that in Genesis 22, 13. And at Passover, the innocent lambs died for the people of Israel. We can see that in Exodus 12. And the entire Jewish religious system was based on the shedding of blood. Whose blood? Jesus Christ for us. And we can see that in the biggest chapter 17 and 11. And Jesus' fulfillment of both the Old Testament types and the prophecies also related in the scripture. Um, when we go back and look at the scripture that he was talking about, the imagery of the sheep and lamb depicts the suffering servant as one who will not fight or protest while on his way to death. You know, a lamb is really, um, they call him the dumbest the sheep and lamb, they call them the dumbest animals because they'll go wherever you tell them to go. But in Luke's account, Jesus trials present him as the silent sheep, especially when he appeared between Herod and Antipas. Another key passage in here is the humiliation, which is the word to describe the humiliation and the horrific treatment that Christ received while he was being going through the trials and while he was being crucified. Jesus was denied justice. 
even though the Roman governor at the time knew that he was innocent, they knew that he didn't have any reason to hold any charges against him, but yet still he consented to the execution. Now it was all foretold because again, Christ died on the cross for our sins, but that made them a murderer because they knew they were punishing him for something that he did not do. So here we see Jesus as the suffering servant of Israel, Israel's prophecy. And it says that seemingly had no hope, but we know that he had all hope and he brought a lot of children, which includes us to him. Um, I also want to explain why I was going through this, why he, why he did not know who, who was being referred to in the scripture, because during this time period, you know, the first century Jews didn't speak much about the suffering Messiah. Um, during this time period, because the Jewish people were facing the Roman rule, they believed that the son, that the Messiah would come as the Lion of Judah or delivering king. They didn't expect a weak lamb. They believed and taught that the suffering Christ would be, was actually the suffering nation of Israel. But if we also go back and look at some study Bibles, um, particular Rye study Bible, it knows regarding um, Acts chapter 835, that before the coming of Jesus, the Jews understood Isaiah 53 as referring to the Messiah. Before Christ came, they knew who he was. They, they referred to the Messiah, but after he came, after Jesus Christ came, well, you know, they accept him, looking for somebody more elaborate. So this interpretation was abandoned as Christians applied the prophecy of Jesus of Nazareth. And Isaiah 53 was then considered by the Jews to be referring either to Isaiah himself or to the people of Israel, who would be the light of the nations. But we know it was really referring to Christ. And this was an opportunity for Philip to expound on the word and explain that to the unit. I also want to emphasize that, you know, because of his hunger and desire for the word, this Ethiopian unit was not ashamed to ask for help. He asked Philip to explain to him what was going on. And Philip being anointed by the Holy Spirit did just that. Um, verse 35. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news of Jesus. So what did Philip preach about? He gave him the gospel. He gave him the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, I think this was a good text to be emphasized in Christ because again, it is bound on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this was a good place for Philip to start it to explain the word of God. Um, and I'm sure during this time period that the unit had plenty of questions that he asked Philip, which was great for the one-on-one -on -one because he was also allowed to expound on what his question was. And Philip was able to explain exactly what was going through during this time period. So this became a, good morning, this became a fruitful witness opportunity for him as well. Now, before I go on, I'll be remiss because you know what I mentioned to you earlier, that we're all called to be evangelism, to evangelize, to expound on the word of God, because you never know what a person stands in need of. So I'm going to just get your paper and your pens out, because one of the things that was emphasized to me is by the Bible, school, Baltimore School of the Bible, was when you run across somebody who needs to know the word of God, the best way to explain it to them was to go through the Roman um, journey. And we call it the Roman road scriptures. Now, we're going to elaborate with the problem. The problem was, is that we all have sinned and we're all falling short of God, of God's glory, and that no one is susceptible to God in his sin. So Romans 3 and 23, which tells us all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And Romans 3 and 10, which tells us that no one is acceptable to God. Okay. But, and what is the consequence of our sins? Romans 5 and 12 tells us, sin to enter into the world because of one man's sin. Remember who sinned, right? And death became, came because of that sin. And everyone sins and no one is without sin. 
And then Romans 6 and 23 tells us when people sin, what is the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. Okay. So again, the consequences of sins, Romans 5 and 12 and Romans 6 and 23. Okay. Then what is the scope? Romans 1 and 20. And I'm just going to be reading a translated version. These are the things about God that people cannot see. His internal power and all the things that make him God. But since the beginning of the world, these things have been easy to understand. They are made clear by what God has made. So people don't have a excuse for doing anything bad. Why? Because God made a way for us to get out of it. Romans 5 and 8. This is the solution. God has shown us how much he loves us. And that while we were still sinners, he died for us. What is our response? Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What is with your heart that you believe and are justified and is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And what assurance do we get? Romans 10, 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What is the result? Romans 5 and 1. Since we have been acquitted and made righteous through faith, we are able to experience true and lasting peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord, the northern one who is our liberating king. Romans 8 and 1. Those who belong to Christ Jesus are no longer under God's judgment. Romans 8, 38 and 39. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else of all creations will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Once you accept them, confess them, believe them with them, God accepts you. He died on the cross for us, and nothing can separate us from God's love. Verse 36, and they traveled along the road and they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and Philip baptized him. First, you got to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then you have to accept him as your Lord and Savior. And when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you want to be baptized with them, which is an acknowledgement to let people know that you identify with Christ's death and his birth and his resurrection. Um, in his death, we go down into the grave and we're crucified. And that's the water of death, the baptism. But when we come up, we come up as new followers of Jesus Christ. We're risen in his newness. That immersion, that completely immerses in water. I know some religions just do the sprinkling of the water, but we do the, the immersion of the water. Okay. Before Philip would baptize this unit, one of the things, if you go back and read the story, one of the things he really wanted to make sure is that he knew who Christ was. Okay. And he was able to proclaim who Christ was. And the unit would tell him, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. You can't confess that unless you have experience with God and unless you accept God as your Lord and Savior. So at that point, he was baptized. But you need the word to compel the hearts of men and women before they can accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Verse 39 tells us, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Now, it doesn't tell us what he thought when he looked up and saw Philip gone, but we know that it didn't dampen his spirits. He was overwhelmed. He was joyous. He was happy because he knew he was walking in his new life. He accepted the Lord as his savior, and the Holy Spirit came on him to give him that joy and that peace. And I believe this man, since he had the understanding of the word, he can proclaim that word to others and compel others to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 40, Philip however, appealed to Azadus, a traveler about preaching the gospel in all the towns 
until he reached Caesarea. And think about that. The Holy Spirit, he's there one minute and he's gone the next. But he went on to fulfill his journey to proclaim his words, God's word in another part of the country. And he continued to do so even after several years later, over 20 years later, he was there still proclaiming the word of Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, after the great spiritual victory in Samaria, in Samaria that Philip had, he was directed to a desert road south of Jerusalem. And on that road, he found a spiritual hungry man. And he took the time to proclaim the scripture to this man, to teach him. We may find other people in our paths who are looking and seeking God who are spiritually hungry. We need to not only know the word, but be able to proclaim that word to men and women so that other people will be saved. We're called to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I challenge everyone to do that. And not only to spread that word, but also in proclaiming it, encourage those to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I have no nothing else. Anybody have any questions, comments? I thought it was a great lesson. And um, I thank you for the different verses of Roman. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when you're out and evangelizing, you know, spreading God's word, people will challenge you. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you need places to go in the Bible to uh, be able to show the proof. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I thank you for giving me these verses that I'm going to go back and study. Uh, some of them. Some Good. Of them I was familiar with, but you always just have to keep learning and growing. So I just Amen. thank you. Let's go. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a wonderful lesson. I appreciated it. And I always learn something when I listen. Thank Praise you. God. Praise God. Amen. Wonderful job, my sister, as always. Amen. Uh, Praise God. I really don't have any questions. I just got comments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you, you did a wonderful job explaining it. You know, um, I'm working on a workshop right now. And one of the things that, that we need to know is who Jesus is and mm -hmm. you know and I always look to the Old Testament to help explain who Christ is and explain his deity because a lot of us want to see Jesus as that little baby in the manger but a lot right. of us don't want to see him as God and that's who he mm -hmm. is and you did a wonderful job of explaining the angel of the Lord you know showing that Christ has always been here even in the Old Testament and these um Sayings in Isaiah, the suffering songs, uh, the servant songs, um, they foretell of Christ. And the Jews were looking for Christ. We know that even the Samaritan woman was looking mm -hmm. for Christ. Um, even the disciples, when they were called, they were looking for Christ. When he went and got his brother, said, I found the one that we've been waiting on. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I think it's very good. And I like the way you showed the work of the Holy Spirit, because I think we take that for granted in our lives, the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always moving in our lives, um, directing us. And yes, we, we we get that urging by the Holy Spirit to do something, and then we question it. And we don't yeah. really want to do it. You know, we wonder. But then when that umption has left us and the next person do it, the exact thing that the Holy Spirit told us to say, then we're ashamed, you know? So right. we have to recognize who the Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit works in our lives so that we can be obedient to the Holy Spirit. So I think it was a wonderful lesson. Um, I do want to point out uh, that this Philip was not Philip the disciples, but this Correct. is the Philip mentioned in Acts chapter six. Um, Correct. And he is referred to sometimes as Philip the Evangelist, you know, and, and he does a great work. And those yes. seven men that were mentioned in Acts chapter six. The Bible only gives us more detail on two of them. Philip and Stephen, right. both of right. them went on from serving tables to evangelists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's a great work. 
And the thing that always amazes me about this chapter is after Philip uh, is, has done evangelizing to him, they come to a body of water in the middle of the desert and he gets baptized. Nothing right. but the Holy Spirit, nothing but God. You know, so I just think it's a wonderful lesson. I'm very excited. And thank you so much for always, always giving us such great details and such good information. And I too like that Romans road to salvation. <laughs> God is good. Yeah. Is there another? Amen. It was a very good lesson. I just like to add a couple of tidbits, if you don't mind. Tough, this tough, happened. <laughs> this happened right after Stephen was killed. Right. And they gathered from Jerusalem, and he Philip took the challenge to go to Samaria. Mm -hmm. If you read the scripture, Acts 1 8, tell us, you know, you're going to spread the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other part of the earth. That's right. Now, Philip, he's, he, I like him more than Paul. It seems like everybody want to give Paul a lot of trouble, I mean, credit. But Philip was the first one that went out and spread the gospel to the Samaritans. That's right, they were. And he the was. Reason, yeah, and the reason Miller was saying they only mentioned two, because those two was blessed mm -hmm. with special gifts. They even had the power to preach. And Philip had the power to evangelize. Philip did things way before Paul, as far as healing people, spreading the gospel. And, and I, want to, I want you to visualize this. The chariot was way in front of Philip. Mm -hmm. God gave Philip the strength to run up against that chariot and still running while he was talking to the man and then the man invited him in. And that's when he shared the word. Now, mm -hmm. I want you to realize, realize this. This man, you're right, this man was rich because the scroll was usually owned by priests. Mm -hmm. This man had a scroll in his hand. It was very expensive to have mm -hmm. a scroll. And he had the opportunity to read the scroll. Because normally the priest would explain it to you. And so at this time while he was reading, he asked. He was thinking he needed help to decipher this. And that's why the angels contacted Philip. Mm -hmm. And one more thing I want to I want to add. This man, if you do your history, this man was already considered a Jew. And that's why Philip didn't get the credit for converting the first Gentile, because this man was considered a Jew already. He knew about the word. He went searching for more information. Mm -hmm. And I just love the fact that God used him, you know, in spite of the persecution he was going through. And that's why they had to roll out of Jerusalem because they won't get killed. <laughs> right. That's what Saul was on his, he was on his reign then. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was. And like you said, just before then, that's when um, Stephen was stoned to death. You know, when he appealed mm -hmm. before the people, proclaiming the word of, uh, of God. So, yeah. Amen. Go ahead. Uh, but as I was say, mention how big that scroll is. Well, it wasn't no small piece of paper. This scroll was several feet long, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like we got a Bible today and we open it up. And um, someone is at the front door. You know, it was huge. I can hold on just a second. I think my wife just locked herself out. <laughs> Y'all go on. <laughs> yeah, it, and it, it was. It was. 
It was handwritten. So it was very expensive. It was very expensive. Mm-hmm. But like you said, this man was well off. Right. And um and but the but the best part about it is this man is now gonna be used to spread the word farther than anybody else now. He is to be right. back his own town. That's right. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. And that's why it helps the end of the earth. This word is going out. <laughs> Amen. 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 Just because you mentioned that we should always be willing to tell someone who Jesus is. We should always be willing to give an account when people ask. That's why we need to study ourselves Absolutely. so that when people ask, we can give an account. And I like what the book of Jews says. That if we won't contend for the faith, we must contend for the faith. And if we won't, then who will? So wonderful, wonderful lesson is always a great discussion. Yeah, and I want to add something um, to the evangelist class they they teach now. They use John 3.16 as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And they tell us now, when you go out, share your own personal testimony yes. why you got saved. Amen. Amen. Thanks for the yeah. uh, Brother Jay, I add to that, we need to add John 3.17 as well. Because it's not just he saved us from our sins. He saved us from condemnation. He saved us right. from penalty of our sins you know Mm -hmm. we were condemned on our way to hell we can't and you read it the wages of sin is death but the gift of god God. eternal life life. so that's uh, right uh you know i thank god for saving me from condemnation i was condemned on my way to serve a penalty and he saved me from it yes we got to tell our story and we got to share the truth too often we go into the world to evangelize and we come up with that holier than our attitude. But we all sin and saved by grace. That's it. That's it. Amen. That's why your personal testify testimony, ain't nobody can deny that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and a lot of times your personal testimony can help somebody else out there on the street. And um for other people who may not know right now, John 17, for God did not send his son into this world to condemn the world, but through him the that the world might be saved. Yes. Amen. And, and it goes, <laughs> y'all going to get me excited here. <laughs> I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Don't be quiet. Spend your two cents. Well, you, Go ahead, you know, we got some more time. We, we, the condemnation is our lack of faith because we do not believe because it says he who doesn't believe is condemned already because mm-hmm. of his unbelief. So uh, I'm glad God put it in my heart to know who he is. So um, yes, we, we got to explain that better. Yeah, we were out yesterday. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> we were out yesterday at uh, Faith uh, at the evangelism fest and um we had to evangelize the christian folk so they they didn't know how to uh, evangelize they didn't know how to talk to people see uh about jesus christ um you'd be surprised how many how many people say they love the lord but um they don't have a relationship with him and when mm-hmm. you go out and evangelize God has to anoint you to go out and spread his word. Because you're a believer doesn't mean that you're able to uh, convince others about Jesus Christ. But God has to give you that, has to anoint you afresh like he did Stephen. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and you got to know the word for yourself. And you got to make sure that it's clear. Do we going to be just like those people? The people will be just like those people that wouldn't listen to Stephen. 
that's why the Holy Spirit is so important, you know, because the Holy Spirit tells you what to say and to prepare yeah. the hearts for men to receive it. Right. But a lot of people, like I talked to a man yesterday, he said, um, yeah, um, I said, what church you belong? Um, and he told me, and I said, well, when the last time you've been? Oh, I haven't been for a while. I said, well, you don't love Jesus. I said, because if you love him, you want you have a relationship with him and you want to know more about him. Well, I work and he does this and he does that. I said, no, you got to go back and you got to um, uh, repent and you're going to have to confess some things. Well, my mama is a pastor. I said, that has nothing to do with you. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. Yeah. We all going to be accountable for ourselves. Oh, yeah. Mama and daddy may have. Remember that song Aretha Franklin said? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But you got, every tub got to stand on his own bottom. That's right. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> okay. Is there another? Well, if not, next week's lesson is called The Soul of Titus. Tarsum. And the devotion reading comes from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. The background scripture comes from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 31. And the lesson itself is going to come from Acts chapter 9, verses 9 to 17. Mm -hmm. And I believe our um, presenter next week will be the luxurious, I want to say minister, <laughs> Joseph G. Miller. Amen. And the G stands for I'm going to study. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are interested, I will be teaching a workshop uh, on the 27th next Saturday for the Connecticut Baptist Deacons Alliance. And it will be on Philippians um, 3.14. Keep our, you know, our eyes of the calling for the, for the high calling of Jesus Christ. And I'll be looking at Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through uh, 20. Um, so if you'd like to uh, join is via Zoom, uh, you're more than welcome to attend. And I will Are you on recording? Are uh, you on recording? Yes, I will be recording it. Yeah. Great, great. I want a copy of the recording. Okay. <laughs> I'll be out of town next week. All right. So, amen. Y'all right. keep... Hey, 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 you know, Joe... I was thinking, man, it would have been a, I was thinking about this a few minutes ago. It'd be a great idea if y'all, let me put my picture up here so we can laugh together. Oh, uh, man, man, technology's not working. All right, so that we can, uh, maybe you could do park, you know, you could save these things and create podcasts or something. Yeah, we do have the recordings. We do post them on Facebook. And you're right, we can take snippets from these and, and post them. So uh, it takes a little editing work. Remember what JJ said, be careful what you uh, suggest. I know, man. I know, man. <laughs> JJ I... will give you a job, man. <laughs> I was going to say, is that Mr. Is that Mr. Dixon's job? <laughs> JJ will, will give you uh, a oh. job. Let's see, you know, you'll be our video editor. <laughs> hey, hey, look, and plus, he's right here on the line. With yeah, he right. heard it, man. He heard it. I, mm -hmm. know, he brought, I know he took a note. <laughs> Hey, God bless y'all. How you think I got hooked up in here? Oh, <laughs> JJ. Got you, Doc. God is good, though. All the time. And, and, and I'm trying a new note taking. Now, y'all see this little sign here? It says Joe Miller yeah. is recording this call for uh, note taking. So it's an app called Phantom, and it's a transcribing app, kind of like uh, Otter. Uh, but it does it automatically and transcribes it. So this is the first one. I'm going to use it, see how it works. Uh, if it works like Otter, it's, it's a good thing because it gives you a transcript of what was said and who said it in order, word for word. So I think that's something that's pretty nice, too, that we can go back and read uh, and study. And, and, you know, like those notes you gave on Romans, you know, because some of us can't write that fast. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the number one complaint that I get from pastors when I go to teach deacons is that people don't know how to lead people to Christ and that deacons don't know the Roman road to salvation. So it's something that, that I'm teaching and I thank God that you brought it up. 
Praise God. Mm -hmm. okay. um, since Pastor Thornton is not online, Pastor Eccles? Right. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful for this time to be reflect and to think about how you use not an apostle, but a disciple to do such a mighty work. We reminded today, God, that you're no respect of persons. Even now, God, yes. take these vessels, God, these vessels that you dwell in, you inhabit in. Use us in extraordinary ways to help us to speak to other people concerning Christ. Father, we need you. We need yes. your spirit to take control of our lives. And we today stand willing and willing and ready for you to use us, God, in any way you see fit. Thank you for this time together. We thank you for the Sunday school. Continue to use it to minister to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, Pastor Eccles. Yes. Uh, did you get a chance to um, get your log off? Not yet. Um, we keep missing each other, the young lady and I. Okay. Uh, I just want to. Uh, I, I still so, have it on tap. I found another. Uh, I have until the thirty first online. I can get it for a good price too, about thirty percent off. Yeah, and that's what she will, she will give you that thirty percent off. And actually, if you have something, you said you had thirty three. So if you tell her, she'll give you. She'll match whatever you got because you know. Okay. Okay. So just just talk to her. Let her know what you found, and and she will get it for you right away. Uh, and okay. like I said, if you don't want to add books, just get the full feature upset. You know, and, I think yeah. we're getting the full feature right now until I decide what I want to do. Exactly. And, and and go with that because that will upgrade all your books and everything and let you utilize a lot of those tools that uh that they demonstrated at that workshop. Okay. Right. okay. Um, that is a very good program. Yes, I, I use it all the time. <laughs> Amen. Um walk with the king, y'all. Uh I love you. Uh, may heaven smile upon you, and I will see you all next week. And y'all pray for me that I can study well to show myself approved, a workman unto God that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing Amen. the word of truth. Amen. 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 God bless y'all. God bless you. Have a blessed week. All right. Thank you. All right.